All right, time for another draftphysics.com video presentation. All right, so on the air track experiment, the Lewin experiment, and um, this version of it. Uh, anyway, a high school teacher. Anyway, I did a video um, explaining how I didn't use the timers and I didn't use the tape measure, and I used another method. And came out with you know results that were somewhere in five percent range of um, demonstrating a problem with Professor Lewin's experiment in that dramatically not the same results he got um, and consistent with the Arbor Scientific results if you can accept certain assumptions about the masses of the carts and likewise you have to accept some assumptions regarding masses here also but it's clear it's probably the clearest video there is of the experiment um, and the only liability was the deception of having different lengths cart decide going through the timing gate so the timing wasn't being produced by a consistent object but the actual times are correct if you account for um, the problems anyway so doing her math with her timers the numbers came out even more perfect. I mean, 30.8 would be the numbers times, you know, uh, as opposed to the out momentum of being 30.05. So, you know, a, a tiny less than 1% uh, margin of error, less than half of a percent of a margin of error. It's so perfect. So I think that should just be pointed out that um, the timers, we can't, if we do trust the timers, because we understand the glitch, okay, that really wasn't a timing problem, it was just how the timers are triggered, um, it comes out perfect, and with minor assumptions. Uh, and perfect, again, as being a debunk of Lewin and Brozo. So let's understand, Brozo has claimed he's proven Lewin's experiment valid, this is completely opposed to Brozo's results. And, um, yeah, you'll have to decide for yourself, I suppose, who you trust. Uh, but anyway, so I guess before I get to those details, well, really, there's not much to detail. So the only real change is understanding that the red cart is going to, you're going to take whatever number you get out of the red cart and you're going to divide it okay by two because it's twice as big so the time is obviously the number on the timer is twice as much because the cart is twice as long now the promotional document for the company that sells this device they it's obviously um someone's there's a mistake somewhere maybe they change the color of the carts you know in some year and so blah 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 but whatever they say the red cart is three times the mass it's obviously only two times the mass so every measurement i've done it comes out to be perfectly logical that it's twice as big i don't think anyone would ever cut a cart you know cut it to a size that wouldn't be consistent with the idea that the smallest card is 100 grams, the next largest card is 200 grams, and the next largest card is 300 grams. That seems to be consistent in the industry. And then you just add a little bit of weight for the springs, and it seems clear that that's all that's on the carts. So there's very little reason um, to doubt that this is a good comparison between a one mass object hitting a two mass object that fits the description of the elastic collision between those two objects and um, yeah there's not much room for doubt and you can verify that the timers are working by the fact that you can measure the speeds by other means that verify the same relationship in terms of the velocity which I've already shown in the other video alright so we might as well just go to the numbers and uh, you now it's pretty decisive, frankly. Yeah. <clears throat> all right, so I should be able to get this all the way uh, visible. I think that's the right one. No, nope, it's the right one. I don't know what the hell that is. We'll worry about that later. Uh, oh, I guess that's her video. Yeah. All right, so that's as wide as it goes. So I'll move the camera a little bit, and hopefully not mess anything up. All right, so it's gold cart, red cart, gold cart, going back. 
and the numbers on the timers are three, you know, 0.3536, 1.429, and 1.798. Now the question on the goal cart going back, the other issue was, is whether you take it as a collumative number. That is, you have to, the number represents, you have to minus this number from this number. So you minus this 336 three, here. Um, but the fact is, it doesn't make much difference down here. It's still less than 1% of a difference. And I say this number is correct because if you, if you do subtract this number from this number, you end up with almost perfectly half of what would be the red cart's velocity. And I measured it me mechanically, and it's clearly less than a half. So this number appears to be the correct number. So you don't subtract this from this. So anyway, and so this red number here represents this number divided by 2 because the cart is twice as long when it went through the timer. So this is the real number here, if you're going to put everything in the same scale. So those are your three numbers. You do the math thing where you just uh, divide the numbers into 100. I, I didn't bother worrying too much about the decimal points. The decimal points are correct relative to each other, but they're not correct relative to any kind of, um, because we don't know the exact length of the cart. Therefore, we can't say how much of a meter it is, whether it's a, you know, tenth of a meter or what it is, so it doesn't really matter. Um, so you do that math, you come up with these proportional numbers as a percent, as a rate, and then I multiply the gold cart times 1.1, assuming that, say, the springs, the little metal springs that are screwed on, each one weighed 5 grams. That was just my estimate. Again, it really doesn't matter if I change this number to a 2, I'm still going to be within 1% of the margin of error, so it really doesn't matter, but you're just accounting for the fact that the hardware that's attached to the carts does weigh something. And obviously the red cart has the same hardware, that is, it only has the same 10 grams added. So um, it, this is just representing that the red cart is twice as heavy, so it's 200 grams plus 10. This is 100 grams plus 10. You do that, you get these numbers and you combine these two and you get numbers that are just decisively close to each other. So all you lost was 0.75, you know, as a, and that's what you would expect. You would expect some loss of momentum, a tiny bit of momentum would be lost by heat and bouncing and whatnot when the springs collide with each other. And so it's perfectly consistent. No, really perfect. It couldn't be, like, you couldn't ask for it to be more perfect in terms of conservation of momentum and, you know, destruction of the uh, kinetic energy as a theory. And it should be understood that in the Professor Lewin experiment, if this number was 30 going in, the number coming out would be 45. So Professor Lewin's experiment is way off this experiment, not a little bit off. I mean, it's way off. You know, way different results. Brozo says this number should be 45. That's his theory. You know, even though you can't possibly make this experiment do that. So, um, yeah. So I think it's a pretty decisive, actually, piece of evidence. It's perfectly consistent with Professor Lewin's second experiment. So let's understand the second experiment in Professor Lewin's lecture video where he accidentally does this experiment where he's trying to connect two carts and make them stick together and they don't stick they bounce the velcro doesn't work they bounce off of each other so it's essentially this experiment the only thing missing are springs so the only thing missing is that this cart doesn't go in the opposite direction it keeps going in the same direction but the number is perfectly consistent it's a tiny speed in that direction um, and these are the numbers in Professor Lewin's second experiment Momentum is perfectly conserved, um, and these ratios are perfectly consistent with what took place in that experiment. Uh, so, you know, I say uh, it's pretty convincing evidence that this experiment uh, demonstrating 
the kinetic energy theory, uh, a consequence of it, demonstrates that there's a problem and that the theory doesn't work, the math doesn't work. So they can say their math works, it clearly doesn't work, it doesn't accurately predict the experimental results. The prediction of the math is 45. Now, in spite of the fact that that prediction means there's free energy, in my opinion, in the universe, it means that you can make a free energy machine. So it's obviously out of whack, just logically, in my opinion, but it's clearly out of whack with the actual experimental results. Yeah, okay, that's probably uh, clear enough. So the only issues were, let's do that again, uh, the red cart is clearly just a two-mass cart, not a three-mass cart. I'm saying that's clear. I think it's also clear that it's twice as long. And, um, yeah, is there anything? And it doesn't really matter about the going backwards in the timer. It's not enough of it to make any substantial difference. But I would argue that you can logically, again, understand that she she's wrong in a sense of that's not how the timer works. The button, when you press it, doesn't give you a cumulative time for both carts going through and coming back. It just gives you the going back time. All right, enough of that. So I guess the rest of this video will be an update video, so I'll go over some of the other videos I've made. And, uh, yeah. Okay, I think that. Yeah, that's probably enough. And some other, um, I, you know, <laughs> well, whatever. I'll get to it. All right, well, we'll talk a little bit about yesterday's uh, conversation with um, Toadie. And, um, <clears throat> you know, and uh, you know, the, the idea would be to focus on getting the experiment done again um, and as well as can be done, you know, just so there's just no doubt. So no reasonable person could have any doubts about what actually is mechanically happening when you do this interaction. Now, I would say these other experiments are pretty simple also. Just launching the two carts with the same spring. The same spring compression, you launch the two-mass cart. Same spring compression, you launch the one-mass cart. Because there are people who are claiming that the one-mass cart can't possibly leave at twice the velocity that somehow it's going to be less than that, um, you know, by some kinetic energy rule. Uh, sort of the idea that you need four times more gas to go twice as fast. Now, even though there's no evidence you do, they believe you do, and therefore they believe you can't create free kinetic energy. Uh, you know, they're conserving kinetic energy and shooting, okay, <laughs> momentum. And I'm clearly arguing that no, kinetic energy is just a fallacy. It's always been just a fallacy. It's been just a something made up in somebody's head as an idea. Uh, it was never true. It, it's never been true. It's there's no good reason to believe it. If you understand how gravity works, that gravity is a time-dependent force, not a distant-dependent force. That it's all about how long you're in the gravity rain will decide how much energy you collect from gravity. Um, <clears throat> that is when you're free-falling. Obviously, when you're not free-falling, when you're stuck being held by a surface, you can't collect the gravity. <laughs> you can't collect more momentum if you're not moving. Uh, but anyway, um, so the focus of the conversation is basically getting somebody else involved in this conversation that can either do the experiment or can make arguments explaining how it really is compatibilism, that there is some idea that there's a concept of momentum and a concept of kinetic energy and somehow they aren't in direct contradiction with each other, which I claim they are. And it's every time they try to combine those two formulas, they just make a mess, as they did in this case. They create experimental outcome predictions that are not consistent with reality. Um, and are, frankly, on their face nonsensical because they create free energy. And we know you can't, if that was possible, the millions of people trying to find it would have found it by now, if it was this obvious. All right, um, so that's part of the agenda. Um, he has somebody, you know, trying to encourage uh, to participate, a physicist, 
and uh, you know we'll see <laughs> you know um, what kind of person shows up first um, I kind of want to have a contest again you know but I there's no way to really run one where everybody stays honest you know too many people cheat um, so maybe just for fun but maybe uh, just a, 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 a you know a dead list of who will be the first talking head physicist to concede Houston has a problem and they have to address it. You know, how long will it take for the, you know, action lab types and the Veritasium types and the Steve Mould types and all the talking heads, you could go through all those, the Degrassi Tysons and the Sean Carrolls and all those people. Um, which one will um, rec it would be first to have the integrity to recognize that yeah this is a subject they should have fixed a long long time ago frankly it should have never gotten broken uh, because it's so anti-Newton again they keep implying that Newton is consistent that Newton says there was kinetic energy when it's not Newton's physics at all and um, you know, they keep showing Galileo and Descartes and Newton as if they had respect for these people, but they really don't. They don't have respect for their science um, because their science was completely different than this uh, <clears throat> kinetic energy idea. Uh, so anyway, just for fun, if you want to post a, a list of who you think, you know, where will Piro be on the list? Will Piro show up after, you know, everybody else has already conceded? How long will it take them? Um, to just admit there's a problem, uh, let alone admit that uh, Gary found it. <laughs> but anyway, um, so uh, yeah, it's, it just seems to me such a done deal. So I'm just sitting here waiting to see how long it's going to take science to have the integrity to admit the truth. How many years will? How many more years will I have to make these arguments? You know, before um, the science-minded people. Uh, demand clarification and a good argument to be presented instead of just nonsense insults. How long will it take for science to have that little tiny bit of integrity? <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, all right, so I think that's probably enough. So, you know, thank you. I got to say thank you to. Uh, it's not a great, you know, I have to say it's not a great <laughs> name. I don't like, I almost don't like calling. A person toady <laughs> you know it's not a great word in America but anyway I guess it's a you know it's interesting um, but anyway um, I mean they call it somebody slacker or something right it's just yeah you know, but anyway I you know I, it's just very um, uh, it's like one of the few tiny good things that have happened <laughs> in the last five years uh, is uh, the tiny acknowledgement that I, you know, I haven't, this isn't just, this isn't just junk, okay, that I'm arguing, I'm arguing real arguments <laughs> that should, uh, th that deserve some m tiny bit of respect. I get less respect than flat earthers, you could argue, and I deserve more than that, better than that. Uh, but anyway, it's, a, it's the way it is. So that's the way it is. So yeah, if we can get somebody to do the experiment, uh, as I keep saying, if all the people have all this energy to do all this hostile hating on me, if they put their efforts together to actually convince somebody uh, of some standing to do the experiment, then we wouldn't be having this argument. Uh, you know, so if they love science, why don't they love experiments? Because they should be asking for them to be done. And the experiments are really so simple and rudimentary that you know, this shouldn't be a big deal. All right, so I'll get to my videos then and uh, call it a video uh, and such. So thank you, Toady. I really appreciate it <laughs> and such. All right, regarding the website videos, so yes, yesterday I did put up a video going through um, the mechanics of the experiment and the changes I made to the reasoning detailing how you can approach portional. So the gold cart is actually a little 
less than, a little more than half the weight of the red card. So a gold card's a little bit heavier. And so that obviously also can fudge the results a little. Now other things I'll point out in a video is, you, okay, so it's that kind of thing. And then it uh, has the numbers in it somewhere in here also. Well, it's not, it's working okay. So this is where she picks up the cart, does the timer crap. So I did go slow motion through the carts moving, explained how you can tell from two different ways that the red cart is leaving at less than half the velocity of the gold cart coming in, and that the gold cart going back is less than half the velocity of the red cart. So there's other ways to verify those numbers. So frankly, it's you know, pretty good video, I think, pretty decisive. All right, Action Lab did a video on the interferometer. I, it's a, not a technically perfect video in the sense that I'm talking sometimes while the video's playing, and I didn't realize I still had the blackboard over the video, um, but it's basically an argument about beam splitting and what actually is an interferometer detecting and whether it's really the wavelength of the light or something or multiple wavelengths actually and that there's lots of logical arguments to be made about how they're not precisely correct in the assertions they're making about what actually is happening and it also clearly goes to the whole wave particle I will say crap um, because, you know, because you're going to have to choose one just like you got to choose momentum or kinetic energy um, it's either something being controlled by a sticky ether or there's no sticky ethers. I'd say there's lots of arguments that make sticky ether useless um, and unviable as a mechanism. And, you know, just the whole idea of, you know, what, sticky ether moving this way and sticky ether moving this way. I mean, the whole thing is, I think, a mess as a theory and I make some of those arguments. All right, so this was, I, I'm making a series of these shorter videos, um, overview videos, all of that kind of stuff, trying to put all of the basic arguments in, you know, a smallest space of videos as possible, um, just to make it easier for people to get up to speed about all the arguments I have made over the last 10 years without watching hundreds of videos and so in the effort also to you know often people don't pay any attention to the points I make in videos and they respond to irrelevancies like what shirt I'm wearing so to kind of focus the argument I'm going to attempt to make videos on a single idea or subject regarding things so this one fact video was on um, <clears throat> weight is energy and uh, you know just pointing out that you can go through these calculations and you can maintain that pressure but they will compress the spring exactly the same amount. I mean the um, so I'm just making the kinetic energy argument about how much you're compressing a spring based on doesn't matter the velocity or the weight ratio. Uh, a scale doesn't care whether you move in fast with a light object or you have a heavy slow object it's really the spring is just measuring the amount of momentum springs measure momentum when you're standing on a scale it's basically measuring your momentum in the sense that you have a net velocity into the earth um, of one meter per second so your mass is your weight because it's your mass times one meter per second uh, you know and it's if you did it sideways you'd see the same result if I pushed your mass sideways at one meter per second into a spring into a scale that you usually stand on it'll weigh exactly the same as your weight from gravity so it kind of decisively points out that although it doesn't look like you're moving a net amount into the earth. The fact is that you are in the sense that you're spending more time going down than going back up. The earth pushes you back faster than you got pushed into it. So technically you're spending more time going down into the earth than going out of the earth. <laughs> and uh, It's a simple way to understand it I think. Uh, but the real point of this particular video is just to point out that momentum is weight.
So any movement of any mass creates a weight, a pressure in the direction of the movement. And that's all you're really measuring. When you're measuring your weight, you're measuring your movement in a direction. And such. All right. So next was, uh, yes, this wasn't directly Sabine Hoffenfeather. Fetter. Um, let's see. So this was, I did some comments and I did some, um, some of this stuff was actually pretty funny and good. So if you want to watch a video, this is probably a good one. What is your opinion of the quote, any attack on me is an attack on science? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so I'll believe that one there. Uh, I do have an opinion, but there's no point in voicing opinions anymore. My opinion is I really, if I have to say who's lower on the scale, right, the average politician or the average conspiracy kook, yeah, I have to vote with the politician. I mean, as bad as that is, because, yeah, all the conspiracy kooks are that, conspiracy kooks. Forget it. They're too stupid to ever conspire to do anything. It's the three stooges. You're sitting there saying, oh, the system has, you know, is against me. How could it possibly be against you on purpose? Okay, <laughs> yeah, it, it does everything wrong, and it, everything sucks. But it's not personal. They're not trying to be stupid. They just happen to be stupid. Time dependent. Well, you can say it all you want, but it's clearly obvious to rational, logical deducers. Okay, that that's the, that's what it is. That's the right answer. Your distance is uh, your argument is nonsense. Because right. So this idea that work equals force times distance is stupid. It's force times how long you're in the force. How long you're in the rain decides how much rain, how wet you get. It's not how far you walk in the rain, it's how long you're standing in it, period. How long you're being affected by it. And it's, to me, that's so obvious, I shouldn't have to argue with reasonable people, but apparently you do. Substantive, because somebody disagrees with Professor Lewin. So again, you're just showing you're, you're insane duplicitous hypocrisy. Right, so they're ragging on me for finding fault with a, a professor, and a professor who obviously doesn't use very kind language. So you see this, and you know, I hate to point to the exist because the flat earth community is on my mind just because of, um, and they do this all the time. You know, they talk about civility and they don't show any, you know. It's, you know, they're cruel and, um, abusive and who are they cruel and abusive to 90% of the flat earthers are actually mentally ill people and um, you know they're just making a living living mocking the retarded and you know doing retarded people fail videos and they're all proud of themselves like they're you know preserving the integrity of science I think they're showing that science doesn't have any of integrity. I don't think they're actually, sh they're not doing science any favors by buffoonery. The paper he published is a scientific paper that had wrong in it? No, you can't. Mm, you coward. Paper. Why don't you back up what you're defending, you coward? No. Fuck. Yeah, I don't know who that was. I don't know who he's talking about in that exact instance, but it doesn't matter. That would be interesting, just so you all know that Newton was against it, not for it. It's not Newtonian physics. Can okay, we go back a little bit? Monads. I think that's, that's why he be was serious so aggressive comment about shoving his religion into his physics. Imperial has some other, some similar kind of wooey infinitude. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, yeah, so there are some Puro comments in here that are, like I said, I thought my... <laughs> yeah, I did all right. Um, in terms of um, witticisms, I witticism pretty good. All right, so jumping to... Let's see, we just did that one, right? Uh, yes, okay. Yeah, there were a few videos that, you know, they're all on the website, so if you can't do the website thing, well, I guess too bad. Um, so the slit experiments, this was a good video just going over um, all of the, you know, again, mechanics of the experiment that everybody keeps ignoring. And I went through a lot of the mechanics. I'm going to decide how big 
okay, the primary bars are. That is the bar. Oh, okay, this was the one fact. So I'm just trying to point out how. So the one fact here is that the outside dimension is critical to defining how many nodes of light there are and where they are. And that sort of blows up all of this Huygens theories and all this other stuff because it becomes kind of obvious that Huygens can't go through the impediment in the middle. So if the outside dimension is defining the size of the slits, that is how many wavelengths fit in that dimension, you can sort of understand this can't be about waves. It has to be about point sources. And yes, you could create waves at the point sources, but that's clearly a different physics than the physics they're arguing. They're arguing the waves are going through the slit. They're not arguing that the waves are being created on the surfaces. So they'd have to at least concede the wave sources has to be the surfaces, and if they do that, it can't include anything called Huygens. All right. So I think it's pretty good. You know, it's only six minutes and 37 seconds, so... Um, yeah, nicely brief. All right. Oh, this was a good one. Okay, so this was... Uh, yes, team is spelled how I feel like spelling it. <laughs> team time versus team distance. This was a good video, I think, because it goes through the whole gravity argument about how this is a, f a force you collect, like rain, uh, making the analogies that your mass is the collector. So the more mass you have, the more energy you're collecting from gravity as you're in it. And that's perfectly consistent with the fact that if I drop a hammer and a feather, the hammer makes a huge dent in the ground and the feather doesn't. Even though they're dropping at the same velocity, one of them collected a lot more energy. So gravity is something you collect. It's energy you're collecting. All right, so you're going to use a nice lot drawings of fuel. to go with it for free. A little Superman logo and different things put in here to explain. <laughs> So yes, this is a very coherent drawing. It just doesn't look like it when it's done. But in its processing, it makes perfectly good sense. All right, so I think that's probably going back far enough. Um, uh, void of facts, that was another good video. I guess we could click on that. Oh, that's versus Puro, yeah, so. Uh, that's... Um, it's obviously on the website, uh, so I, I probably, I don't know if I made an update video since that video. But anyway, I just respond. It's a two-hour video, very long. And frankly, yeah, so I, I would say that this of all the videos is the least necessary to watch because most of the arguments aren't physics arguments. They're arguments about how human beings should converse and... Um, you know, the difference between science and philosophy, and this isn't philosophy. The arguments being made here are mechanical arguments about things that are testable, not things that aren't testable. All right, and the argument is, is that who should be doing the testing? The 300 years of scientists in lab coats being paid to do the tests, or do I have to do all the tests? Do I have to build my own LIGO? Do I have to build my own nuclear accelerator? Do I have to build everything and do everything to, you know, you don't have to prove yourselves right. I have to prove you wrong. So you won't prove Eddington was a good experiment by duplicating it. I have to prove it was a shitty experiment by duplicating it. I have to go get a 12 foot telescope and I have to, you know, a 12 inch lens and I have to go to Africa and do a freaking, you know, and because you'll never do it from space, right? Even though the resolution is 400 times better, we'll never see it done from space. And why? Because guess what? It doesn't work. <laughs> That's why we'll never see it. It doesn't verify your theory, therefore it will be an experiment we'll never hear about ever, 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 because it's not what you want to believe. And that's the sad truth. And by you, I mean scientific community types, people interested in science. You're not really not interested in the truth. You're just interested in the story they're telling you of wormholes and dark matter and dark energy and dark all this stuff, all this bullshit. You're just living in a Star Wars fantasy and you don't want to hear about any notions of 
grounding those stories to anything called reality. All right, well, I'll take a pause here and see if there's anything else to throw in, but I think that's probably enough. Ah, here to be back. Uh, so I did add uh, the conversations um, with Toadie to the debate physics. So there's a link there on the website to the debate physics, which doesn't have any extras on it. <laughs> okay, it's just pretty simple. Of the different subjects that are within the realm of at least somebody paying some attention to. Uh, and it's really thin content, frankly, because nobody wishes to participate in anything called the debate. And so um, this is all there is so far. And um, we'll see if we can get somewhere. But, you know, so far, no debaters showing up. Nobody willing to make anything called a decent video. I mean, I'm not going to publish indecent videos where people just lie and I have to waste my time refuting their lies. That I'm not going to do. Uh, so until the troll types can moderate their behavior a little bit and make an actual physics argument, uh, yeah, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> yeah, I'm not playing in that turd-filled sand pile. Anyway, so uh, now that's probably enough, but we'll make sure. Well, I'm going to decide it's enough. <laughs> Whether I'm sure or not, it's probably enough. So we'll just go with the idea that it's enough. And so I will say, as I have said before, this has been a DraftPhysics.com and DebatePhysics.com video presentation. And such, and so forth and whatnot.